we could hear the platform breaking up. We could hear almost as if the welding joints were melting. And it was then, I think, that uh, a few of us shook hands with each other, not knowing where or what was going to happen. I could see people standing on the spider deck and a few people in the water. And then you got the huge gas explosion and the fire came right down to the water. When it receded, there was nobody stood on the spider deck anymore. You did look at it, and you were all inspired and frightened at the sheer magnitude of what was happening. It was like being in hell. One hundred and ten miles northeast of Aberdeen, where the North Sea is some five hundred feet deep, the Piper Alpha was part of a massive oil and gas drilling and production network. The steel legs, or jacket, supported a series of production modules where the oil and gas, pumped from thousands of feet below the seabed, was mixed, cleaned, and passed through pipelines, either via nearby production platforms or directly to the main terminal at Flotta in the Orkneys. Over 200 men lived in accommodation modules on top of what was essentially a chemical refinery. On the night of July the 6th, 1988, of the 226 men on board, 62 were either working or relaxing while most of the others were asleep. They felt secure, knowing that not far away stood their support platform, the Thauros, as well as several standby ships, including the Silver Pit, constantly circling the rig in case of emergencies. It was a clear, warm evening, and it had been much like any other day for the men on board the Piper Alpha. Shortly before 10 o'clock, a warning signal flashed in the control room. There had been a huge gas leak in C module, and the first of a series of massive explosions was to change forever the lives of those who survived. Before the fire destroyed the control room, a mayday was transmitted. I'd gone down to the cinema, and I just sort of got a bit of time. I was sitting on the floor at the back of the cinema when the explosion happened. You could feel it sort of vibrate through my whole body, and uh, the trim from the roof uh, or the ceiling fell down to the floor. And everyone just rushed out to see what was going on. Suddenly everybody was on their feet, shouting what was wrong, what was going on, making for a door, and then the lights went out. And just being the one exit open that night, there was pandemonium by the door, they're all crowding up to get out the door. We were sort of congregating into the dining area, and the offshore installation manager was telling everyone that uh, a mayday had been put out and we should be getting help soon. Um, by this time, the smoke was getting quite acrid in, in, in the dining area, and I had got down to a lower level on the floor to try and get away from the smoke. And I thought at the time, really, it was a bit silly just sitting here, I ought to do something to get away, maybe get down to the lifeboats, which were on the lower levels. Ten minutes into it, we realised it was a real major incident, and it was a, a no-return situation. You know, if you, hadn't, if you weren't getting off quickly, you weren't getting off at all. The rig was disintegrating in front of us with these 24 inch pipes just getting thrown about like night snakes and the flames and the smoke and everything. The sight was so, so terrifying, right, and hard to comprehend that some people thought it was safer to go back into the accommodation and they went back into the accommodation. Uh, they never survived. I tried to get down to a lower level from that area and tried two or three times and had to keep coming back into the accommodation, damping down this pillar slip I had, going out again. And I thought, well, I've got to get out. I can't sit in the accommodation. I've got to get outside and get to a lower level. Um, but eventually I just sort of became lost and ended up going to a higher level instead of going to a lower level. And at the higher levels, the smoke wasn't quite so bad. And in fact, there were people on the heli deck shouting that there was clear air on the heli deck. Um, and I thought, oh good, I'll go up there. Then I had second thought to think to myself, it's no good going up, you've got to go down. There was this tremendous confusion. And I always remember that somebody said, I'm afraid. 
a bit more explicit than I'm afraid, right? And one of the lads had said, look, you're afraid, everybody's afraid. So, when, when you're, everybody's afraid, there is a comfort there. It's, you know, it's not just yourself, you're just not a coward. There was a point when we got trapped in the corner because the smoke had come up the jacket very quickly, so we couldn't go back. I got down on my knees with this other guy to try and suck some fresh air through the grating. And I was also saying some prayers as well at that time. And at that moment, I called up to uh, the sort of 20 or, or so people who were above me and said, look, we've got to go, we've got to get out of here and we can't, we can't waste any time. And as I was saying that, somebody had thrown a rope over the side and, uh, and it was long enough to, to reach the sea and the spider deck level, which was about 90 feet below us. Ed Punchard and the other divers had managed to reach the spider deck 20 feet above the waves and well below the fire on the main platform. The Zodiac rescue craft, launched from the support vessel, the Silver Pit, now sped towards the rig. We were about, what, about 400 yards off the rig and we witnessed there was people waving to us that were on the rig and as it transpired they were the uh, divers and uh, the coxswain looked at us and we all looked at one another, you know, and the coxswain was, he was like saying, are we going to go for it? And we thought, yes, we'll go for it. So the coxswain, we flew right in. And we were in between the tharos and the piper. And I always remember the noise, the noise of the flames, it was deafening. And the further in we went, the, the hotter it was, I mean, the heat was, I remember my boat suit starting to smoulder. The divers safely off, Charlie and his crew headed away for the silver pit. But 20 minutes after the first explosion, worse was yet to come. Within, oh, I suppose, two or three minutes of getting onto the silver pit, uh, there was a, another enormous explosion, a different one to the first one, but in many respects a, a much worse one and, and a truly horrific sight. It's probably, and I'm sure it will remain, the most chilling thing that I've ever witnessed. Just prior to that, I could see people standing on the spider deck and a few people in the water. And then you got the huge gas explosion and the fire came right down to the water. And uh, when it receded, there was nobody stood on the spider deck anymore. And I just started shouting something or other. Probably a bit of a, a release, you know. Said, oh no, God, you know, all this sort of thing. And um, Stan was consoling me a bit. And I turned around to Stan and I said, "If you hadn't got off by now, you weren't getting off." But incredibly, men were still alive and desperately trying to escape the inferno. Bob Ballantyne was one of them. We still believed at that particular time there would be a helicopter rescue, a helicopter evacuation. When the lads went up there, uh, there, was a, there was a continuous explosion, but there was a further explosion which engulfed that part of it and engulfed the helideck. Uh, some of the lads have never been found again, they were incinerated. We could hear the platform breaking up, we could hear almost as if the welding joints were melting and metal grating on metal. Um, so I think by this time the, the heat was quite severe enough to, to actually melt the welding joints. And it was then, I think, that uh, a few of us shook hands with each other, not knowing where or what was going to happen. And I was wondering then whether the, what the best thing would be to sort of be overcome by the smoke and not know what was going to happen next. Um, but I think then desperation got hold of me and said, no, you can't, he says, you can't just sit here, let's go on, you've got to try and get away. We got down onto uh, the bottom level, 84 feet above the water by this time. We was traversing along that level when there was a sudden explosion and we were just lucky we were by a water unit, the water testing unit, which is a heavy steel shed, and he threw me behind that and we got around behind that and it was flame. This explosion really had stuff flying everywhere. The heat that night was 11,000 degrees centigrade. That's how hot it was. 
The best way to describe it, what was actually happening at that time, is like one of these surrealist drawings, like something like Salvador Dali does. The metal was actually on the platform, was just running like butter. So intense was the heat. What was on the back of that uh, shed was seen as rock all tied up, so Barry got his knife out and cut it loose and dropped it over the side. And I remember saying to him, as that rope reached the water, he says, almost. I said, well, I'm not going down it unless it's in the water. He says, don't be a fool, man. He says, we've got to get off here now. I said, OK, then. So he set off first down the rope. I was on the edge um, doing as a teacher in RGIT with one hand across the nose and one hand across the shoulder to hold your life jacket in place to stop it riding up. And uh, as I was about to jump, uh, a chap came behind me um, shouting his feet were burning and uh, gave me a quick push. So instead of going in a controlled leap into the air, I went head over heels, thinking one of the last thoughts I remember at that time was that I've got away from the platform and now I'm going to break my neck hitting the water. But I didn't remember hitting the water at all. All I remember is, is lying um, in the sea with my life jacket on, obviously, um, just looking up at this platform. I think to myself, thank God I'm, I'm here still. Mike Jennings had fallen 150 feet and had survived, but Bill Barron was still hanging on for dear life. So I went down that last bit and my feet were just in the water and I said, oh, this is all right, I'm all right now, I'll hang on to this. So I was hanging there and a swell came and lifted me under the rig and then back out again and I said, Christ, if I let go of this rope, that'll for all be under there. And I could see it was just a mass of flame under the rig. The sea was on fire this time now. Just a mass of flame. Everything was on fire. But I looked across and I could see my mates across uh, in this other leg. And I thought, right, good. I'll come back up again and I'll go round and I'll get them. As I made my way up, uh, day two, <clears throat> there was another explosion and they too were engulfed. Uh, they were incinerated and burnt. And uh, the, the emotions then that you feel is one of relief. It's terrible for the top of it. Because you go, that could have been me. So your first emotion is one of relief and saying, oh goodness, thank goodness. Then you have the, the guilt, the terrified feeling again comes over you. But the body swam away out, he's a good swimmer, him, and he was well out by this time. But he turned and came back in, and he says to me, let go of that bloody rope. He says, come on. I said, I'm not letting go. I said, look, I was really coming. So he just spotted it then, too. But he said, you'll have to let go of the rope. He says, I won't come right under here for you. I said, yes, I will. But as it was, I did let go of the rope, and he fixed the hold of me, and he said, he did come right there. He fixed the hold of my jacket and got me in on, on the boat. I suppose I was in the water for about uh, 20 minutes to half an hour. I could hear helicopters flying overhead, and I could see the standby boat, the silver pit, um, circling around. And I stood up on this petition and waved to try to get their attention. And the silver pit came round and picked up this other fellow and came round again to me. And they saw me a, a line with the, um, the life boy on attached to it, a loop. And I just uh, held on to it, and they pulled me in, so I was almost sort of water skiing on this platform. Fortunately for us, the tide or the current took us away from the platform, and it was then I felt the first sense of relief. I said, oh, it's terrific, I'm going away from the platform. Everything's going to be OK. And I looked up, and there was a fireball in the sea. The sea was in fire. The only way I could cope with the situation what you do as a child is you turn your back net. And I thought, well, if, it can't see, if I can't see hit behind me, then the flames can't see me. And that was the only way I could cope with the situation. Helicopters and rescue boats were now transferring survivors suffering from first degree burns and shock onto the Tharos. There's one chap who springs to mind, in particular, is a fellow called Roy Carey. He came into the little hospital area, and I can remember being utterly shocked by what I saw because the top of his head had been, been so badly burned that you could actually see his skull. And yet, when I looked at him in the eye, he, he had tremendous spirit, and he said, don't worry about me, I'm absolutely fine. I'll just sit over there and you look after these other guys. And 
I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing, and I had to look at him and sort of say to him again, "Are you are you all right?" He said, "No, no, I'm fine. Just don't don't worry about me. I you know I'll just sit over there and look after the others." And it was the most uh, extraordinary sight, and and one of the uh, the most tremendous things I've ever seen. I'd never seen such spirit come from somebody. Mike Jennings, suffering from severe smoke inhalation, was now safely on board the Tharos and in medical care. When I got to the infirmary, I was complaining more, I think, about the, my eyes and my able to breathe properly and the fact I was been retching rather than the burns in my hand. And the doctor said that the burns in my hand were superficial and the fact I'd been immersed in water anyway would stop them blistering, so they, wasn't, they weren't too bothered about that at the time. The captain in the mess logger had told us, he said, you're 40-something, you're, you're a 40-something survivor we've picked up. That was absolutely devastating, because I think by this time it's near enough 12 o'clock, something after 12 o'clock, and the paper, working on the paper, there was about 240 people, and for the for they tell you the forty second <clears throat> survivor. It's not too come from. The destruction of the Piper Alpha continued unabated, and now the rig was entering its death throes, taking with it the lives of 167 men. When you are out of danger, when you are away from the rig, and you had two or three seconds to collect your thoughts. You did look at it, and you were awe inspired and frightened at the sheer magnitude of what was happening, of what was going on. It was, it was like being in hell. That was Mother Nature at her worst. You know, what we were doing is we were dabbling with Mother Nature, and she had won round one. Throughout the night, RAF rescue helicopters carried the victims back to the mainland. And in the dawn light of the following day, the survivors finally arrived at Aberdeen for medical checks and debriefings. But the nightmare of flame and fire was to change their lives forever. Charlie Haffey was awarded the George Medal for his rescue efforts and owes much to the support group, the Piper Outreach Team. As far as I was concerned, the Piper Outreach team was probably one of the greatest things that ever happened to me. It was great to be able to pick up a phone and say, life is tough at the moment, help me. And there was that voice on the other end of the phone that says, yes, of course I'll help you, speak to me. And it was great to be able to go into the office, you know, and say, life is tough. And somebody will come and talk to me about it. And my friends are like that, you know. They say, well, talk about it then. It's, it's really, I, I like, you know, it's, it's been great therapy for me. You know, it really has been great therapy for me. When I returned home uh, from Piper Alpha, um, I had an enormous sense of, uh, of responsibility. Um, by being a survivor and having escaped and having seen so many people die in front of my eyes, I felt very strongly that I had to do something uh, to pay back my good fortune. It wasn't a heavy feeling. It was a very light feeling. It was, it, it came very much out of a, an intense sense of well-being that I had, having just survived. And it was out of that, that feeling and drive that um, I was spurred on to, to lobby and campaign, and, and ultimately, of course, to write a book about the event. There's no doubt that if Piper Alpha was, a, say, a chemical plant, that was on shore in the United Kingdom, that the, the differing laws and rules and regulations that then governed onshore installations would have stopped and completely avoided the accident which occurred on Piper Alpha. The book had helped Ed Punchard to deal with the trauma of Piper. Others, like Eddie Amira and Bob Ballantyne, returned to their families, but it was to take months and even years for the nightmares to ease. Benjamin had um, one of these space guns, those little battery operated things, and it had three settings on it for different noises. One was similar to a police car, 
One was similar to an ambulance or fire engine. And the third one was a dead ringer for the emergency bells on Piper. Absolute dead ringer. And he came up behind me one day with this thing. And he had it on the wrong setting. And off it went. I went through the roof. You had to peel me off the ceiling. I went ape, bouncing off the walls. I got hold of the toy and threw it against the wall. I really lost my temper. It, it just sent me totally. It flipped. You know, I'd gone off my head. And the poor boy was was frightened. You know, how can I explain it? He was um, terrified, I think. Absolutely terrified of what I'd just done. Because you know? he'd never seen me like that before. We're getting on fine now. You know? But he's, he's a lot older now. He's ten now. so He can understand more. And... Uh, I've apologised to him more than once. And through everything that was happening on the platform, through the, the devastation and the fear and everything else, I always knew I was going to see Pat again because I loved her. So that's the thing that kept us going, that I would see her again. Bye. The second night, it had started to hit me just what had happened. And the two of us were sitting, I feel like, hiding in the flat, pretending we weren't in. Um, and it felt like we both had this just incredible black cloud pressing down on us. It was just a horrible feeling. But at the same time, you felt very strongly, oh, will this ever go away? Will we ever feel all right again? But you knew it would. You know, we would be able to cope. But it was so strong, so real. What made matters compounded matters and that at that time was bodies weren't by this time turning up and being brought ashore and as a survivor um, Bob felt terribly guilty about all his friends who died and he felt he had to either get in touch with or go and see widows and apologise for having survived when their husbands hadn't which was just awful and it was so hurtful to see this happening to him him being like this Pat never ever allowed me to feel sorry for myself. That was one of the things she never allowed me to do. When I used to feel sorry for myself, she told me, don't you feel sorry for yourself. You survived. You've got myself, you've now got a family. Go and do something. Reconstruct your life. But don't feel sorry for yourself. Because you've got us. I have to point out to myself, it didn't actually happen to me. I've just been a a second-hand victim and really the most important thing for me was making sure that Bob was all right. There were times when I really did want to just crack up and break down but as I've just said it, it wasn't me it happened to so therefore it was terribly important to me that things should be fine with Bob. We're having a, another child at the beginning of December so that's another positive step, I think. There was 30 bodies not recovered in a paper and alpha. You must have some place for to cry, for to weep, for, for to go there and pay your respects. It's part of, say, the healing. You don't come to terms with it. You, you don't even accept it. But for me, the Pipe and Alpha Memorial is more than that. I go there on the 6th of July, and for me, the 6th of July is every Wednesday, and the first, first Wednesday in July. And I go there, and I go there at night time, at 10 o'clock at night, just when the, the first explosion. And I can stand there, and I can talk to my mates, uh, <clears throat> and for 10, 15 minutes, but I get it again. So that's how important a memorial is for me. <clears throat>